President, council members, fellows and members of the Institute, colleagues, it's my very great pleasure to add my personal welcome to our 2017 AGM lecture. Uh, firstly, thank you for ensuring a smooth election of Robert as our new president and the other office bearers. Uh, I'm told other recent elections haven't produced such strong and stable results. Uh, and I'm glad not to have the embarrassment of postponing our equivalent of the Queen's speech. Uh, should point out no goats were harmed in the production of tonight's AGM. I, I think I should probably try and escape that metaphor now, though, as I'm not sure that comparing our new president to Theresa May is a good way for us to begin our working relationship, uh, Robert. Although possibly a better one than comparing you to Jeremy Corbyn uh, or Tim Farron. Uh, Anyway, there has, I read in the papers, been another, if somewhat less successful, at least for some, election held recently with potentially significant implications for Brexit. Although exactly what these will be, it's hard to predict, which is why I'm delighted to welcome Miles Selleck, the Chief Executive of City UK, to speak to us tonight on that subject. As bankers, as business people, <coughs> as citizens, we are, if anything, experiencing heightened uncertainty since last Thursday's election as we travel towards a destination that seems unclear except for the very simple fact that Brexit means Brexit. And I think it's in times of such economic and such political uncertainty, volatility, that as bankers we can use our professional knowledge and skills to help our customers and communities manage the uncertainties and risks and prepare for a range of possible outcomes, possible futures for themselves, for their families and for their businesses. So I would see Brexit as an opportunity for bankers. And by that, I don't mean an opportunity to trade on volatility, nor even an opportunity to move to Paris. Rather, it's an opportunity for us as bankers to demonstrate our skilled professionalism, our social purpose, and to help reconnect banks, bankers, and society at a time of uncertainty. But we can only do this if we are well informed. And I can't think of many individuals with a better grasp of the issues, possibilities, and risks of Brexit than Miles. As many of you will probably know, Miles joined the City UK as their Chief Executive last year, following a career in broadcasting, then in public affairs with HSBC, more recently with Prudential as Director of Group Public Affairs and Director of Group Strategic Communications. With his background in banking, policy and risk, if anyone can steer us through the Brexit issues and priorities for financial services, I think it's, it's Miles. And I'm you know, delighted not only to see you all in the room tonight, to hear from him, we also ha we're also joined by, by, by members and, and fellows from around the UK, probably from around the world tonight as well, on the webcast, uh, including I saw on the list a certain uh, Mr Barnier from Brussels, who I'm not sure why he's tuned in. Maybe he wants to know what's going on as well. I wouldn't blame him. Anyway, there'll be time for questions once Miles has spoken, but for now, please don't leave, but remain and join me in welcoming Miles. Thank you. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for, uh, for that introduction. Uh, so explaining Brexit, uh, obviously a very low, uh, low bar uh, for the evening's discussions, but I will do my best. Uh, and Robert, congratulations uh, on your election to the presidency. I look forward to following you on Twitter uh, imminently uh, to hear the very latest of what's going on, hashtag uh, whatever the appropriate hashtag would be. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, along uh, this evening. It's a great pleasure to join you um, and welcome all also to everybody who is following us uh, through the online live stream uh, this evening. I look forward uh, to the questions uh, on Twitter uh, later. Uh, it's a particular honour to address you uh, for tonight for the first Chartered Bankers Institute lecture uh, on Brexit. Um, it's a particular honour because uh, if recent events are anything to go by, I expect it will be a long and eventually ancient tradition uh, of trying to keep up with the, uh, the latest on Brexit. Uh, and I'm sure that you'll agree that we meet at a particularly interesting time, uh, and it's certainly the end of one of the busiest 12 months in politics uh, that I can remember. And following the result of the hung parliament uh, last week, I will be very careful uh, not to make any predictions uh, on the time that we have uh, ahead of us. In fact, when I was first approached uh, about the role uh, at City UK, uh, I think it's fair to say that David Cameron was still Prime Minister. Uh, Brexit was a mere possibility and a minor possibility at that. The next general election for the UK was going to take place in 2020 and Hillary Clinton was certain to be the next President of the United States. Uh, so uh, as you'll appreciate, uh, anything that I say uh, this evening ought to be taken uh, with not just a pinch of salt, uh, but with a significant degree of scepticism. 
Um, but as you may know about uh, the City UK, uh, we represent the UK-based financial and related professional services industry. We work on its behalf, producing evidence and analysis of its role and contribution to the wider national economy. And in the UK, in the EU, and indeed internationally, we seek to influence policies that drive competitiveness, create jobs, and deliver lasting economic growth across the whole of the UK. UK-based financial and related professional services have long been a strategic asset across the UK, uh, and that's one reason why I'm particularly pleased to be in Edinburgh today. Um, as you may be aware, the industry employs over 2.2 million people across the whole of Britain, uh, but what's often forgotten is that two-thirds of those jobs are actually outside the M25, uh, and there are almost 50,000 of those jobs uh, here in Edinburgh. And I have the pleasure of coming to Scotland on a regular basis. Uh, and in the meetings that we have had both today and yesterday, it's been great to get a perspective from the industry across Scotland and to discuss our policy priorities with policymakers from across the political spectrum. So I feel that there's no better time than this evening to explore the challenges and the opportunities ahead uh, as the political parties in Westminster work to form what will be the basis of the next UK government. Uh, and that government will have a full agenda. Uh, of that, I think we are all agreed. The Brexit negotiations are due to start imminently, and all eyes will be on the Prime Minister to deliver the best deal for Britain. In addition, the industry will follow a number of domestic policy priorities with real interest, issues such as the future of regulation, uh, the skills agenda, uh, and corporate governance. Uh, and there are other challenges at home which might not directly affect the industry but will affect the environment uh, and the climate within which we do business, not least the future of austerity, infrastructure investment, education, healthcare and so on. And that all along, alongside all of this packed agenda for the Prime Minister, there are clearly the unexpected events that governments need to deal with and will always have to face, uh, such as the dreadful fire that we saw at Grenfell Tower uh, in London uh, earlier this week. But this evening, I would like to focus on the challenges and the opportunities that Brexit will bring for the financial and related professional services industry, and for the banking sector in particular. As you all know, it's been almost a year since we in the UK cast our votes in the EU referendum. And since then, we've changed Prime Minister, we have had a UK general election, and now we face the start of formal negotiations. As an industry, throughout that period, our priorities have remained constant and have been built around a very simple fact. A strong and mutually beneficial relationship between the UK and the EU is vital to the economic strength of both. Businesses in Britain want to continue to provide and have access to the widest possible range of financial and related professional services and products without the need to establish a commercial presence in each market. And at the same time, EU firms want and need continued easy access to the UK as Europe's undisputed financial centre. So what is the City UK doing to help deliver this? Our work started pretty much the moment that David Cameron, when he was Prime Minister, announced his intention to hold a referendum back in 2013. We have sought to build and make the case for this industry to identify the risks as well as to present the opportunities and to provide the solutions uh, as part of this debate. We have presented these in discussions with Number 10, all the relevant government departments, new and old, with our European friends, including through a range of European member state dialogues and with international contacts, both London-based and around the world. As the negotiations develop, our engagement will intensify and it will accelerate. In our discussions with the UK, European and international stakeholders, our message and our priorities have always been clear and have been guided by our key principles. And those are to deliver clarity and stability to the greatest extent possible, to defend the UK's preeminent position in financial and related professional services, to map out an exit from the EU which maintains access to key markets while safeguarding future relations, to move swiftly to advance trade and investment opportunities with the rest of the world, both in developed and in developing economies, and to develop an even deeper partnership between government, regulators and business. As part of this, in October last year, we published a flagship report on Brexit, 
which we commissioned from the Oliver Wyman constituency. This comprehensive analysis presented a fact base on the size of the financial sector, uh, the most comprehensive that's been done, um, and set out the impact of potential regulatory options arising from Brexit in terms of jobs, tax and industry revenues. I don't want to deluge you this evening with Soviet-style tractor factory statistics, but Oliver Wyman's analysis is clear, it is compelling, and it is, as I say, comprehensive. So the first thing that I'd point to is that the UK-based financial services sector earns somewhere between, and this obviously depends on how you measure it, somewhere between 190 and 205 billion pounds per year in revenues. It generates more than 70 billion pounds worth of taxes per year and contributes a surplus approaching 60 billion pounds to the balance of payments, as of the analysis done by Wyman. When the broader ecosystem of financial and related professional services is included, the data shows, as I say, that the industry employs 2.2 million people across the industry. More than 150,000 of those are employed in Scotland, and it pays more in tax than any other industry. And it also contributes nearly a total of 12% of GDP, one pound in every eight generated by the UK economy. An exit from the EU that puts the UK outside the European economic area terms of trade, but otherwise allows access to the single market on terms similar today, will cause some disruption, according to the Oliver Wyman analysis, but a minimal impact on UK-based activity. Revenues from EU-related activity would decline by around £2 billion, roughly about 2% of UK of total international and wholesale business. About three to 4,000 jobs out of 2.2 million would be at risk, and tax revenues would fall, albeit by about 500 million pounds a year. At the other end of the spectrum, a low access Brexit, as opposed to the high access Brexit, in a scenario where the UK moves to a third country arrangement with the European Union without any regulatory equivalents, and the relationship with the EU is defined under the terms set out by the World Trade Organization, about 40 to 50% of all the EU-related activity done in the UK would be at risk. To put that in terms of uh, pound value, that's between 18 and 20 billion pounds. Up to 31 to 35,000 jobs in the financial sector part of the ecosystem would be at risk, together with about three to five billion pounds worth of tax revenues. But the impact on the ecosystem would be greater still. A total of around 75,000 jobs at risk and around eight to 10 billion pounds worth in tax revenues. This is usually the point when we go through this with treasury officials uh, where they pay particular uh, attention. For the banking sector, third country status could ensure a high level of autonomy for the UK in setting rules on banking, but could potentially drastically restrict trade in banking services between the UK and the EU. My own view is that the final outcome is likely to fall somewhere between these two ends of the spectrum. And so building in the certainty of sufficient transitional or adaptation agreements will therefore be vital to maintaining economic growth, competitiveness and financial stability. And this point applies equally to related professional services. Obviously there will also be opportunities arising from a new network of trade and investment agreements that the UK will be able to negotiate with its partners. And from the nurturing of growth areas, new growth areas that will boost jobs, taxes and the trade surplus delivered by the industry, things such as fintech. So as we now enter the negotiation period, we are focusing on highlighting our key priorities for the UK-based industry. Priority issues which we believe need to be addressed in order to achieve the best possible deal for the UK and for the EU27. And I'd like to explore some of these in just a little bit more depth. Firstly, the early agreement of interim arrangements. We have been clear that the industry wants to see early agreement on interim arrangements, including both a bridging and an adaptation period. They are key to ensuring an orderly exit from the EU and will help support efficiently functioning markets, protect investors and ensure continuity of service to customers by avoiding a cliff edge at the end of the two-year Article 50 process. For every one euro spent with UK firms with an EU-based financial services company, EU businesses spend more than six euros 
purchasing financial services from UK-based financial services companies. Each of these transactions represents a business need met by a provider of a service in the other market. These services cover the full range of banking and other financial services and represent by far the largest segment of the current EU market for such services. In banking, the cliff edge effect could result in these important uh, activities to customers being disrupted or left uncertain. Existing contracts and agreements could be subject to legal uncertainty, with the potential for contracts to then become unenforceable with a consequent impact on economic activity. So the adaptation arrangements will play an important part in ensuring that cross-border trade in services can continue without disruption as industry and customers take steps to adapt any necessary changes as a result of the UK's new relationship with the EU. Secondly, I'd like to talk about access to talent. We're also asking the UK government to ensure continued access to the best talent, be that homegrown or from across the EU or indeed elsewhere in the world, to ensure that the UK has the skills to retain its status as the leading global financial centre. Reassurance over the status of EU nationals in the UK should also be provided as soon as possible. And it's also important that we make sure that any final arrangements on access to talent don't just cover those people who are moving from one job to another, say from a large organisation, a large financial institution in Europe to its activities in the UK uh, or vice versa, but also means that we're able to attract the best fintech talent in the world and the best entrepreneurs in the world to continue to come to the UK. It's worth bearing in mind when you look at fintech in Silicon Valley that 40% of the fintechs in Silicon Valley were started by people born outside the United States and the two largest sources of people are India and China. So we need a programme of talent uh, that covers the whole world. So what do we want from the future relationship between the UK and the EU? What does that need to look like? What we want to see is a bespoke deal, an agreement with the EU that delivers mutual market access. This should be based on mutual regulatory recognition, including mutual recognition of qualifications and standards, and regulatory cooperation, and provide the same or comparable market access rights to those that we currently enjoy. It should also deliver a regime for recognising and enforcing judgments from UK jurisdictions in the EU and vice versa to ensure legal continuity. This is in the interests of parties to contracts in the UK, the EU and globally, and in the interests of the ongoing primacy of common law and dispute settlement in which the UK leads the world. Ultimately, at the City UK, we believe in a strong and outward-looking UK with a close relationship with the EU and with other key partners around the world. And we believe that our industry, a world-class industry, has a key role in making that possible. But it's easy to get caught in the Brexit debate and forget that there is a world beyond our discussions with Brussels. The next government and the governments in Westminster, in Edinburgh, those around the UK, including the Metro mayors as well, um, the regulators and supervisors and the industry will need to focus on more than just our new relationship in, with the EU to ensure that the UK remains a competitive international leader and international financial centre. And there are a number of challenges that we need to face to achieve that, as well as opportunities to capture. And one of those key issues is around corporate governance. We welcome the government's focus on corporate governance to ensure that the UK maintains its world-leading position in this area and that companies are managed in the interests of shareholders, employees and customers. The UK is widely recognised as a world leader in corporate governance and this strength helps to ensure that it's an attractive place to do business and in which to invest. The importance of corporate governance for the proper functioning of markets and ensuring of investor conference, uh, confidence has been very well established. A well-run, transparent company that engages regularly with investors and other key stakeholders increases its likelihood of attracting investment and creates therefore a virtuous circle. A measured, evidence-based approach to corporate governance reform will prevent business disruption and support the government's objectives of creating an economy that works for everyone. And we will all be conscious as well of another key priority, that of the radical transforming power of technology. 
It continues as technology develops to, in effect, compress space and time, accelerating flows of information, data and knowledge, and enabling individuals to communicate and collaborate over great distances almost instantly. Or certainly not with the internet connection I enjoy back home in London, but that's the theory. Technology, especially fintech, uh, will transform our ways of working and how we interact with our clients and customers and the services that we provide. The banking sector, as much as the rest of the financial services and professional services industry, needs to adapt and to embrace this change to remain competitive at home and abroad. And that also touches on skills. Technological process, progress will also lead to a change in the type of talent that we require in the industry, with a need for depth in digital skills such as data analytics and cybersecurity. To be able to adapt to a changing world, we believe that we need to do more to attract diverse talent to the industry. This should include offering a range of ways into the industry from apprenticeships to reskilling and to lifelong learning. And we should be reaching out into communities more than we currently do who might not traditionally have thought of our industry as something that would be a career option for them. And I know that Simon in particular is very focused on this agenda. Over the coming months, we will explore these issues in more detail as we start to prepare ourselves for the period after Brexit has completed. The need for the UK to remain an attractive destination for businesses is more important than ever as we renegotiate our relationship with the European Union. The UK is and will remain Europe's financial centre, uh, in the words uh, not least of Wolfgang Schäuble in his speech earlier this year, as well as the leading global cluster of financial and related professional services. This depth and breadth of both financial and human capital is vital to the ongoing stability of the European and global economy. And so the critical economic imperative is to find the right deal and to find a win-win for both sides. The best Brexit outcome would recognise these dynamics and realise the opportunity to deliver mutually beneficial results for the UK, for the EU and for the rest of the world. This would be a genuinely ambitious Brexit, one that drives jobs, spurs innovation, is a dynamo for economic growth, and not only attracts the best and the brightest from around the world, but welcomes them and retains them. We need a Brexit deal that maintains and strengthens our country's position as the leading international financial centre and as one of the most attractive and competitive places in the world to do business. And we therefore need government to work with industry to allow us to play our role as we move forward towards the UK's long-term success. And hopefully that will present a good subject for the future Brexit lectures uh, at this event. Thank you very much. About 20, 25 minutes for questions uh, now. Matthew, I believe you're going to feed in questions from Twitter. Um, so this is wonderful in this day and age where you, you know, members of staff can have a job looking at Twitter all day and then, uh, and then, and then do that. So you, if you put your hand up, I'll take some questions from Matthew from Twitter. But are there any questions in the room for Miles, uh, first of all? Oh, Catherine. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, sorry, I should say there's, I saw I failed in my duty. There's a microphone going around so that the people uh, who are live streaming can hear us too. Hi, Catherine Smith. Thank you very much for that general introduction. There have been quite a few changes recently in Europe and changes potential in Europe. And I'm not talking about uh, the admission of new countries and all that. I'm talking about minor things like general elections outside Britain. And we have Macron, a complete outsider, suddenly coming through in France who has stated that the European Union needs to reform. And we have some question, although perhaps milder, about what is going to happen in Germany. And we have various referenda actually being announced in places like Catalonia. Can you give us some indication of the degree to which this will aid or make more difficult the achievements that you wish in Brexit? Uh, thanks very much. It's, uh, it is always important to remember that other countries have general elections too. Uh, I, uh, we met a 
delegation from the Bundestag Finance Committee uh, earlier this week uh, and I said to them it's great to see you. Uh, obviously we'll be talking about the uh, outcome of the general election uh, to which the German MP I was talking to said yes we're fascinated about what's happening in France. Um, <laughs> which put me very much in my place. Um, I think it's absolutely right to be aware of, uh, of the, uh, the impact that these elections might have. Uh, and I think part of the reason that we are in the timing that we are in is in order to allow for uh, the French elections uh, and the German elections. I think that has been a factor. Um, I would say, though, that the conversations that we've had in Brussels and in member state capitals and with delegations from uh, Europe into the UK uh, is that the negotiating position of the EU27 is reasonably well set. Uh, the phases that they are looking for are reasonably clear. Uh, we are currently in the phase one process. They want to see progress on citizens' rights. They want to see progress uh, on agreeing a financial settlement. Uh, I don't see that any change in elections would change that. Uh, or any change in governments would change that. I think what's also notable uh, is that despite the expectations that some political commentators had had, that after Brexit we might see a populist wave through Europe, is that what's notable is that hasn't actually taken place. Uh, Macron is, as you say, a pro-European. He ran against somebody who uh, was explicit on their platform of taking a referendum to the French people on the euro and then a referendum to the French people uh, on membership of the European Union and that candidate was very soundly defeated. Um, I am not going to comment on the outcomes of the elections in Germany, that's a matter for the German people, uh, but I would say that whether it is between one of the two leading candidates, they have a similar position uh, on Brexit. Um, it would appear that the, the upset that some people were looking at, potentially in Italy with the Five Star Movement, um, also seems as if that is perhaps a little more in question. They seem to be falling back in the polls. Um, the, the clear priority for the Europeans has been very straightforward pretty much from day one. Uh, and it is that they maintain the single market and the success of the single market and the unity of the single market. And at present, I don't see that we have uh, any chance. And as I said earlier in the discussion, I make any prediction with a, an enormous reluctance. Uh, but as things stand, I don't see that that's going to change significantly. I think that the issues that the UK government uh, and this industry uh, are going to need to deal with and the sorts of reactions to those issues will be pretty consistent. Robert Dickey. Um, a, a recent Economist article mentioned that um, the UK has been hiring Swiss negotiators to assist with the UK effort. So my question is twofold. First of all, is, is there any substance to that uh, uh, view? And are, the, are we hiring Swiss negotiators? And second is, given the events of recent in, uh, the general election and the possibility of a softer outcome, do you think that a Swiss-style relationship with the EU, excluding possibly Schengen, could work for the UK? So I, I can't comment on the uh, HR practices of uh, Whitehall. Um, however, what I would say is that um, it would not surprise me if we are hiring negotiators, not just from Switzerland. Um, we have had offers of trade negotiators uh, on secondment from Australia and New Zealand. Um, it's notable that the European Union, uh, which has trade negotiators, many of whom are considered to be amongst the toughest uh, and the best in the world. The European Union has hired Canadian trade negotiators recently, uh, so I understand. Uh, uh, partly, apparently, in order to make sure that they uh, apply the CETA deal uh, in the appropriate way. So there is a, a, a sort of ongoing trade in international trade negotiators at, uh, at international level. Um, I don't know if they command transfer fees, but you know it can only surely be a matter of time. Um, in terms of uh, in in terms of the UK situation uh, and whether or not that makes a Swiss deal uh, more likely, um, the first thing that I'd say is there is no such thing as the Swiss model. Uh, in the same way, as you'll know, that there is no such thing as the Norwegian model or the Turkish model. These are not off-the-shelf solutions that can then be applied to another country. Uh, it is uh, a much more organic process of deals developing over a period of time, additional uh, issues being negotiated and so on. 
Um, with the, the greatest of respect to our Swiss colleagues, uh, what I would hope for is a bespoke British deal. Uh, and one that uh, reflecting the importance of the UK as Europe's international financial centre from the point of view of our industry recognises that when you have 40% of Europe's capital markets sat within the UK, when you have the international, one of two genuinely international financial centres, uh, New York being the only other one, sat within Europe, and we will remain within Europe even, we won't, even if we won't be part of the EU, when you consider the growth dynamics that the UK financial services and professional services industry contributes to European economic growth, I think 1.1 trillion uh, of investment per year according to some uh, analysis. You know, I would hope that actually what we get is a deal that recognises the influence and the importance of it. And also, on the regulatory side, if you look at the European supervisory authority, there is a disproportionate number of British citizens within those uh, institutions. If you look at the thinking within those organisations, British thinking is overrepresented within that. And that, I think, is entirely natural when you think that these people are trained in the International Financial Centre on the other side of the channel. And one of the questions we've been asking to the European supervisory authorities is, what are you going to do to hang on to that expertise? You know, are these people still going to be able to work within EOPA or whatever it may be uh, after the UK leaves the European uh, Union and it is something you know that we've had quite a, a useful and constructive dialogue on so I'm hoping that we can have something that is ambitious for it for a UK deal. Miles, Miles, I had a sort of follow-up it's partly a follow-up to Catherine's question but actually it follows quite neatly from, from, from the answer you've just given there as well which is to to what extent um, would a hard or relatively hard Brexit damage the EU, mentioned a little bit about that, but particularly sort of in your view, to what extent do EU member states sort of beyond the ones who have a big interest already in financial services, the obvious, the obvious sort of uh, Germany's and, and France, the, you know, of that EU 27, how much do they really understand about this and the, the, the potential impact of, of Brexit on them and their economies. So I think it's a it's a really important point, and um, the, in fact there was a, a Bundestag analysis that uh, was uh, released or came out um, uh, a few days ago, uh, which did exactly this analysis. Uh, uh, we've not had a chance to, to crunch the numbers in detail, uh, but they showed that there was a price to German economic growth of, uh, of Brexit, and obviously the, the harder, uh, to use the term loosely, the harder the Brexit, uh, the higher the um, impact on growth. Uh, and Germany was relatively insulated, but a country like Ireland, according to that analysis, was less insulated uh, from that. And I think that one of the things that we have stressed is that actually there is a win-win uh, scenario in this, that actually a Brexit that is, uh, makes it more difficult for the UK to trade with and to provide services to the European Union actually comes at a cost for European consumers and European citizens and European economic growth, which therefore comes at a cost for European job creation. Uh, and we have stressed that message uh, very hard. I would say that amongst the people who we deal with, who are typically people who are familiar with and comfortable with financial, uh, um, uh, the financial and related professional services ecosystem, they get the importance of that. Uh, and I think you can see that in some of the, uh, some of the comments, such, uh, such as Wolfgang Schäuble's comment, as I said uh, earlier this year. There was a leaked report from the Econ Committee of the European Parliament, uh, which appeared in The Guardian uh, in February, uh, Econ being the committee that deals with uh, financial services, uh, which again made exactly that point. Uh, and Bruegel, which is as, one, as close as you get to uh, one of, uh, there are two basically sort of European think tanks, in F almost in-house think tanks. Bruegel is one of them. Uh, and they issued a report again around March, practically an in-house report, which again showed the economic cost for Europe of getting a Brexit deal wrong. So we have stressed that there is a mutual benefit, particularly when it comes to our industry, uh, of getting a deal right that protects services, protects products, protects consumers, and enhances European growth and British growth. Thank you. John, sir. Hey, John Needham, um, I, I think few would argue with all of the things you set out as uh, desirable outcomes, um, but if we accept that no deal is better than a bad deal, um, 
what what's your view on the the proposal that perhaps the deal should come before the UK populace again for a vote once we know what we're voting for? Uh, I, I can spot a hospital pass uh, <laughs> from from a reasonable distance. My eyesight isn't quite that bad. Um, that ultimately is a matter for the politicians, and I'm very glad to say that a second referendum would ultimately be a matter for the politicians. Um, I would say that from the point of view of business when it comes to uh, referendums uh, that obviously business uh, likes to have certainty uh, and it likes to have stability. Um, and you know that is the only thing that I would say when it comes to what is fundamentally a political decision. Uh, but the clearer that we, uh, we have circumstances, uh, the better. Uh, and that applies as well to, as I think your question alluded to, knowing what the circumstances of uh, departure are going to be. Uh, and I think it would be helpful if my concentrated on the words within the Article 50 wording uh, that make clear that the negotiations ought to have due regard to the final shape of the relationship. Uh, and that is not a stage uh, of negotiations that we have reached yet from the point of view of industry and knowing how we can continue to serve customers uh, and look after staff the sooner we get to that part of the negotiations, the better. And the sooner we get to some kind of clarity or visibility or indication um, of some kind of bridging period uh, and whether that will uh, be in place, we certainly have argued strongly that it ought to be. Um, and quite what that bridging period looks like, that adaptation period rather, uh, looks like, is it a uh, sort of halfway house membership of the EEA uh, for a period of time as we then move into the final nature of the deal. That's something that we need to know and we need to know it sooner rather than later and we've made that point on both sides of the channel. Skillfully avoided, I have to say that. But you know, we, 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 we got into the voting habit earlier at the AGM so without wishing to create a policy position for the Institute at all, I think um, given that we're not a representative group of the population by any means, it might be quite interesting to answer John's question for ourselves. So it's a quick show of hands, who here feels that the, a, a Brexit deal, if there is one, should be put to the population again? Okay. And who feels it shouldn't be put? We've had enough of referenda. So that's about 50-50. It's a hung parliament, I think, isn't it? Again, <laughs> sadly. But it's, it's interesting that it's, it's that side and that side. <laughs> yes, it is. The house, the house is divided. Yes. Yes. Great. No, Matt. Oh, sorry. Yes. Miles, Stephen Prevost. Um, nobody ever speaks about the stakeholders in these discussions. And by that, I mean the consumer, the industry that will ultimately decide whether or not uh, it's going to be a success. What's your thoughts on why that is the case? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question, Stephen. And I think that um, hopefully you'll have seen that actually customers is at the heart of what we're talking about here. Um, I think that uh, it's a, an important part of making sure that the, the role that we play as industry, and I'm not just talking about City UK here, or indeed just financial and related professional services, I think this is something that pretty much business across the board ought to be stressing that there are absolutely issues of high politics in this. I don't dispute that for a moment. And there are absolutely issues of trade, of diplomacy, of you know, macroeconomics and sort of historical sort of tectonic shifts and trends that are happening. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, our jobs in this room and the jobs of anybody who runs a business, large or small, is to look after your customer, wherever that customer may, may, may be, whether that customer is in the UK, you know, whether they're in Edinburgh, whether they're in London, whether they're in Dublin, whether they're in Frankfurt, Berlin, Warsaw, or wherever it may be. And I think that, therefore, is something that we as an industry need to be pushing. We've been pushing that consistently with government in making clear that there is a disruption effect, there is a disruption risk, there is a dislocation risk, there is a financial stability risk. And all of these ultimately will happen at a macro level, you know, sort of things that uh, keep treasury officials awake at night. But we are the people who need to look after our customers. And ultimately, um, it's important for politicians to bear in mind that customers are also voters. Um, and I had another question, uh, Miles, obviously you talked a lot about sort of clarity in your, in, in your remarks and that's in short supply at the moment, we know, but even after the, the negotiations and the you know, final Brexit, however long that will take, uh, given the need for whatever the scenario, there'll be complex and quite long-term uh, transitional arrangements, I mean, how, how long do you think it will be until we get certainty? 
I think it depends. I think I think it depends what kind of certainty you're talking about. Um, so it's interesting. We were talking. We were in Brussels not long ago, and we were talking about the length of adaptation. And one point that somebody made, which was quite a powerful one that hadn't occurred to quite a few of us, was that adaptation will almost by necessity um, happen uh, at different paces. So some industries might potentially need longer than others. And does that need to be reflected uh, in, any, uh, in any deal? Um, but also, if you grandfather citizens' rights or guarantee citizens' rights, it's conceivable that you, for some people you could have a lifetime adaptation period that actually an EU citizen who is, a, who is living in the UK and or a British citizen who is living in, say, Spain or whatever it is, and there is an agreement under this uh, model, there is an agreement to guarantee those rights for a lifetime, you know, we are talking about a transition period that in some cases may last mm -hmm. 80, 90, 100 years, depending on a, yeah. how, how many mm -hmm. cigarettes somebody smokes. You know, it's a, um, uh, it's a totally, different, uh, totally different dynamic on that. In terms of the, the certainty, how long till we get it, I think we need to get through the phase one part of the negotiations. I think there needs to be movement, and I think the Europeans have been extremely clear that they want to see movement on citizens' rights and on the financial settlement before we move on to the phase two elements. Um, and I think that is uh, ultimately going to be down to the progress that can be made on the negotiations uh, once they start. Um, what we've been um, adamant about is that the sooner there is clarity and the sooner there is some shape on the nature of the bridging and adaptation period uh, and on the nature of the final deal uh, and whether that is sort of heads of, uh, agreement, uh, heads of terms type agreement or whatever it may be, the sooner businesses will know what they need to move, if they need to move anything and how they can continue to look after their customers. Well, in terms of certainty, I promised we'd finish about half past seven, so we've probably got time for maybe one or two quick questions if anybody has what is it Kerry Kerry Faulkner um, this isn't meant as a hospital pass question I hope you don't <laughs> take it as, as such given um, what you said about the Treasury having a I can't remember how you put it an eye-opening moment when you um, talk about these very stark figures and the implications I was just wondering how much of a challenge is it in your role to make sure that there is a complete acceptance and understanding of these massive issues, I'm speaking about the financial services impact here, um, within the decision making, influencing population of those people that you're, you're dealing with daily. And a second part of the question is, is around the press and we're reading daily of Brexit stories. The financial services impact doesn't seem to figure that highly. It's not one of the sexy topics that we read about all the time. And we know how influential the press can be in these sorts of things, so I guess that's another challenge you've got. Both um, very good questions. So in terms of understanding, what we sought to do is make sure that the research that we provide is uh, as uh, compelling uh, and as authoritative as it can be. So when we commissioned the work from Oliver Wyman, we, we stepped back from it. Uh, so we commissioned it and we said, do the analysis and let the cards fall where they may. And actually, if what comes out of the other end is that actually the impact of uh, Brexit is either greater or far lesser uh, than we thought, then that's what we go with. That's the analysis. And actually, the advantage of the Wyman research, because it was independent and it w because it was so thorough, uh, is that when government departments, central banks have run the numbers through their own models, which they have, uh, they have come out with very, very similar num uh, numbers, uh, which reassures them that the analysis analysis is correct. Um, the, I think it's fair to say there was a learning curve, a very rapid learning curve on both sides of the channel uh, about what Brexit meant. Uh, I think things that people had assumed uh, underpinned the way that business operated and the way that trade operated and the way that economies operated were suddenly looked at properly for the first time in quite possibly decades. Um, and a lot of things that people had taken for granted or hadn't even considered uh, are now sort of very front and centre, particularly in some other industries. Um, so in terms of the way that, uh, say, um, integrated supply chains work and so on. 
Um, so we've been very fortunate in the fact that Treasury uh, has been a very constructive uh, partner in the conversations that we've had. We've had a very positive uh, ongoing dialogue with them and with other go government departments and a very positive, candidly, very positive and ongoing dialogue with the institutions in Europe. In fact, when I first went out in September in this role uh, to Brussels uh, for my first set of meetings uh, in this job, uh, the word that came up in almost every meeting I had uh, was, was pedagogic. You need to take a pedagogic approach. You need to be teaching us what this means for your industry and therefore what that potentially means for Europe and indeed for the UK. Um, so people want to understand. I think it's fair to say that amongst those who track our industry normally, so like I was talking about the Econ Committee or DG FISMA and the Commission or the German Finance Ministry or French Tresor or whoever, they get it, they follow it, they track it, they understand it, and they want to know, they want to know more about it. Um, our challenge, and we are undertaking it at the moment, is to make sure that people who are engaged with the negotiations who might not be f as familiar with financial and professional services understand what's at risk, um, what the potential opportunities are, and that the people that we normally engage with are helped to make those messages as well. So we're, it is a, I have to say it's been a, a I, I wouldn't characterize it as a awkward or difficult set of discussions. People want to know, they want to understand. They might not always agree with the analysis, uh, but if we can provide, as we do, an authoritative underpinning, they will at least take it seriously, in our experience. Um, in terms of the press, we, we do a lot of work uh, with the press um, and obviously there is a part of the press uh, that will always uh, cover uh, financial and professional services issues in a lot of depth. Uh, so I'm thinking here of the Financial Times, publications like The Economist, a lot of the broadsheets. Um, we probably don't get the cut through uh, in some of the, the mass market uh, media. We get a huge amount of coverage on broadcast. Um, so Euro clearing. Uh, for instance, uh, was a massive issue earlier this week, uh, and we got a lot of coverage uh, on that. In fact, uh, on one night, uh, I managed to appear on the ITV News, the BBC News, and Sky News talking about it, um, which was uh, notable only for the fact of how unimpressed my children were, uh, and, um, and also how boring they thought Euro clearing was. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so we do get a lot, but I think the thing that we need to be really conscious of is that um, Brexit is one of the biggest stories uh, that has happened for a very long time. And I think we sometimes forget in this country quite the focus that the UK gets. Uh, so we had the news editor of a large international news organisation do a, a private event for us. And he pointed out that the biggest stories uh, that they had had this year uh, anywhere in the world uh, were in terms of international interest uh, with the Manchester attacks, uh, the Manchester attack um, and the, uh, the UK general election being called. He said it beat Macron, uh, it beat um, uh, Trump, the Trump inauguration. The focus is phenomenal and Brexit is a very large part of that. And the problem that we sometimes run into is because the negotiations hadn't started and everybody was sitting around waiting for concrete uh, stories to develop, the pressure from uh, news editors uh, on their reporters to find stories on Brexit was enormous. Uh, and typically those stories wouldn't be in the financial and professional services space because they're not as glamorous, candidly, uh, as others. And uh, apart from certain things that have become totemic uh, and iconic, like Euro clearing, you know, so people, it's something people, even if they don't understand what Euro clearing is, they can grasp the concept of a critical part of the UK ecosystem potentially being taken out of the UK and put into Europe. Uh, and those are the sorts of stories at the moment that I think people are looking for. I think as the negotiations develop, we may well find a, a slightly different approach from the press. Great. Well, Miles, my, my I mean, thank you for that, uh, that tour de force of the Brexit landscape, if that is indeed a phrase I'm allowed to use, I guess as a transitional arrangement around using French for the next few years, so that's okay. I think what, what came across uh, to me, and, and perhaps will be no, no, no surprise, is that certainties in the you know, in, in short supply in the short term, the medium term, I hadn't quite triggered about the, the long term and that, uh, you know, potentially 80, 90, even people talk about 120 year lifespan that now uh, uh, certainty. So 
What, what I am certain of, though, is that um, you know, we in financial services have a, a strong and sensible, are you sensible rather than stable, uh, uh, voice making the case for Brexit that works for UK banking and financial services and therefore for the economy as a whole, um, both to the UK Parliament, the, the national parliaments and crucially in, in Europe too. So you know, more power to your elbow and best wishes from the Chartered Banker Institute. And I was also struck at the end when you talked about the pedagogic approach needed in Brussels. Teaching is something that we know about at the Chartered Banker Institute. So if you need our help and assistance at any point, please do call on us. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Miles Selleck. Thank you, Miles. Thanks for